Hello and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project webinar. This afternoon's program is titled Shapers of Cyber Speech, Silicon Valley and American Discourse. I'm sure it will prove to be an edifying discussion. My name is Nate Kazmarek. I am Vice President and Director of the Regulatory Transparency Project for the Federal Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of our guests. And today we're lucky to have a great moderator in Stuart Baker. Stuart is a partner at Steptoe & Johnson in Washington, DC. From 2005 to 2009, he was the first Assistant Secretary for Policy at the Department of Homeland Security. If you'd like to learn more about the extensive bios of our guests today, uh, you can visit our website, regproject.org, that's R-E-G project.org, where we have all of their complete bios. In a moment, I'll turn it over to Stuart. Uh, once the panel has completed their discussion, we'll go to audience Q&A. So audience, please think of the uh, questions you'd like to ask our panelists. Audience questions can be submitted via the Zoom chat function at the bottom of your screen or by using the raised hand function and we will call on you directly. With that, Stuart, Billy, Neil, thank you very much for being with us today. Stuart, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nate. Uh, and for those of you who are thinking about questions, I would suggest that the first thing you do is type it into chat because uh, we'll be trying to take those questions first and Nate will uh, summarize them and ask them, uh, uh, and then we'll turn to uh, people who've raised their hands. So uh, it's best to include it in the chat. Um, the two panelists that we've got today are very thoughtful on this topic. Uh, <clears throat> Billy Easley is a policy analyst at Americans for Prosperity in Arlington, um, and uh, uh, Neil Chilson is a fellow at the Charles Koch Institute. Uh, um, as you might expect, they're probably both uh, kind of closer to the business middle of this debate. And so I will be pressing them to acknowledge and explain some of the other views that uh, the debate has thrown up, and there are plenty of them. Uh, uh, so, um, and, and since I am the moderator, I will, uh, I'm thinking about you're taking a Silicon Valley view of moderation. And if they say something I really disagree with, I'll just cut them off. <laughs> so I, uh, let's, let's start that, that, that tells you kind of my, uh, uh, my prejudices in this area. Uh, I, but let's try to get them all out. Uh, and Billy, I'll start with you. Uh, what are the reasons people think 230 needs to be handled and, and maybe more uh, specifically, what is the problem with platforms and speech today? What are people worried about? Depends on who you ask, I think is the, the easy sort of lawyerly answer to that question, right? If you talk to people who are on the right, um, most of the people that I talk to on sort of grassroots conservative activist level, right? Their concern is, um, to put it bluntly, if the president of the United States could be taken off of Facebook and Twitter, What's the likelihood that I could be taken off of Facebook and Twitter, right? Um, and I, I'm going to give them a, a little bit of credit here, right? Some people who argue this say, hey, listen, you know, I didn't really see a clear articulation of, of rules about why, um, you know, President Trump could be taken off, but not, you know, the Ayatollah um, right. or propagandists from the CCP. Um, and I think it's really incumbent on the uh, on platforms and interactive computer services to do a better job of communicating what the rationales are for the specific content moderation decisions that they take. Um, so okay, that's on let, the, me, yeah. let me ask Neil to give, give us the, uh, the view from the left uh, about uh, what's wrong with speech on, on modern social media platforms. Sure. So, so while Billy, um, I think, accurately summarized the concerns on the, the right as uh, too much content being taken down or too many people being taken down, um, that, that concern does come up some on the left. There's been plenty of groups on the left who feel like they have been, their content has been unfairly uh, moderated or that they've been pulled down off, off of platforms. <clears throat> but the more um, animating concern on the left is that there's certain types of content that aren't being taken down. So types of hate speech or types of uh, 
uh, dangerous views in in their in their mind, or offensive views, or um, maybe even just commercial views that that they disagree with, uh, that people are profiting off of, you know, bad content that's online, and that the companies really should be forced to to take down more content. So it's it's kind of diametrically opposed in many ways to to the concerns on the right. So I'm going to try to look for places where the left and right might agree on these issues, and I'm not sure we'll find them, but let me let me put forward one and you tell me uh, uh, what you think of it. That uh, uh, there's a common meme that says, look, all we know what the social uh, media platforms want. They want to make money and they want to do that by selling ads to people whose attention they've captured and the way to it. Uh, capture attention is to get engagement and engagement is another word for pissing people off at somebody else uh, so that they want to watch more and more stuff that feeds their prejudices and tells them how much somebody hates them. Um, And so without even meaning to, the social media platforms are creating division in the country building up hatred and a sense of otherness with respect to other people who are on uh, social media. And that um, uh, Section 230 has enabled this kind of irresponsible behavior. Um, Thoughts on that view of uh, the profit motives in uh, how social uh, uh, media uh, refers you to particular content? Yeah, so I, I think that is a common um, sort of story uh, about the the social media platforms, and I'll, just setting aside the Section Two Hundred and Thirty part of that for a bit, mm-hmm. um, I, I think there's been some really good social science work, and it, it's ongoing. I mean, our experience with these platforms and this type of media is not that long, um, and so it's no surprise that um, when people come in contact with ideas uh, that they haven't spent a lot of time around in the past, uh, which is much more common online than it is offline, um, that um, feelings can get can flare up. And so uh, so the question is whether or not these platforms are profiting from that. Uh, and I, I think that's a difficult question to answer. I think people are drawn in some ways to the entertainment of you know, owning the libs or, you know, owning the Republicans. And, 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 and some, some ways it's, 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 um, you know, it's entertainment, it's sports, it's like a team uh, thing. And so is it, is it right or wrong for companies to, to provide uh, that type of entertainment to people who want it? I, I don't know. That's, that's a, that's a big question. I think it, it does, it does, suggest that we should, as users of social media, spend some time thinking about uh, how we are engaging on it and why why we're drawn to maybe get into fights um, that we wouldn't have if we were sitting across the table from uh, from another person. It sounds well, like it's one of those situations where you're they're mixing up technological problems with cultural problems in some in some ways with this. And the one thing I'll simply add here is there has been some legislative discussion about this because Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana, has the Don't Push My Buttons Act, which doesn't just target targeted advertising, but also explicitly says, hey, you know, you should not be able to use people's data to um, bring up, you know, um, specific content to, you know, get a rise out of them, as he described it, and on, on the Senate floor. Well, and that does, <clears throat> it is interesting that because that approach conflates the privacy concerns and the push my buttons concern a, into a single unified f- field theory of what's wrong with social media that uh, uh, of this sort, that uh, uh, you pull everybody together because you want their data. Uh, and once you've gotten enough people together, nobody else is going to uh, uh, attack your unassailable uh, uh, niche. Uh, and then you can keep people engaged in this fashion. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a theory. I, I kind of agree, as Neil was hinting, it doesn't quite go to Section 230 so much as it goes to um, a, a, a critique of the uh, what's been called surveillance capitalism. Uh, sure. And we're not going to try to solve that problem as well today. Um, uh, let me ask whether there is another critique that might span uh, ideological uh, um, concerns. Uh, And that is to say, when Silicon Valley 
demonstrated that it was going to cut off President Trump and that it was going to make sure that parlay or parlor uh, or parlor uh, couldn't be used by him or anybody else to uh, express views that he had been expressing, um, it raised the question whether Silicon Valley as a whole or the, the leaders are in a position to say, look, America, there are some things you're just not going to be allowed to say. And they may be doing it now to views they find offensive, but you can be reasonably sure that if people started to advocate for things that were fundamentally against their business interest, they'd find a way to shape that discourse too. Uh, and that's a way of suggesting that maybe there's just too much power over our discourse in a group of relatively insular companies out in San Francisco. Billy? Um. I actually think this might be a situation that Neil, Neil, Neil and I might disagree a little bit here on this point. Um, I'm a little bit more worried about this than some of my other right of center colleagues are. Um, I think, so Jillian York over at the Electronic Frontier Foundation wrote a little bit about uh, the AWS decision not to, to host Parler, for example, right? I think there's, and I think I want to be clear, I think there's a very big distinction between Facebook and Twitter saying you violate our terms of service we're no longer going to allow you to host speech, right? And infrastructure, right? Internet infrastructure companies saying, hey, we are, we're not gonna host Parler anymore. And I wanna I also note that yes, the Parler may not have been a perfectly good faith actor. Uh, it may have failed to actually, um, you know, create content moderation, uh, you know, uh, uh, frameworks, right? Um, but it is concerning, right, to, to hear about these companies saying, well, that are further down the stack, deciding no longer to host uh, specific platforms. And I think, um, I think I'm think i a little uncomfortable with that. Um, at, Neil, we've talked in the Slack about this, but I'd love to hear, <laughs> have this yeah, discussion I mean, now. I, I think you're right, Stuart, that this, the, the sort of concentration or the perceived concentration of power over speech is certainly something that brings um, the left and the right together in, in, in being concerned about these big companies. Um, I think if you put it in a historical context though, it's pretty obvious that it's never in the history of humanity easy, been easier for a single individual to get out their idea and test their ideas in the marketplace. Um, and that's because of these, it's because in part, because of these big companies, but also in part because of the many much smaller companies who do something similar. Um, there's lots of avenues. You know, Gab is still online. 8chan is online. Parler is, has new hosts. Like there is a wide range of uh, infrastructure companies out there who can serve the needs. Now, it is concerning when the big ones, uh, you know, face political pressure, essentially, and, and social pressure to take down speech. And I think uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I, that's, I, and I, so I think as a, as a sort of a social matter, we should push these companies, we should, uh, we should encourage these companies to talk, to, to be platforms of tolerance where lots of views uh, can be there um, and can, can, you know, work things out in, hash things out in dialogue. Um, but that's, that's pretty different from suggesting that government action should require such things. So uh, it, this is probably another topic that we're not going to get deep into, which is the antitrust uh, uh, issue, whether the problems that people are concerned with, and especially the problem of too much speech suppression, would be resolved if there were more aggressive antitrust measures being taken. Uh, I, 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 I have a podcast, uh, Cyber Law Podcast, and um, uh, on the last podcast when we were talking about uh, people who were taking on Silicon Valley and whether they were taking on comic book arch villains, uh, uh, Amy Klobuchar came up because she has both raised antitrust enforcement and uh, um, Section 230 reforms, uh, a kind of double-barreled punch uh, that led me to compare her to Dr. Octopus. Uh, I, <clears throat> it, but I think 
the idea of having breaking up the, the companies is a separate one. And let's see if we can stick to 2.30. Uh, so let me, let me now just take us to 2.30. Uh, and uh, I'll ask, uh, Neil, can you walk us through? Well, actually, why don't I do this? Because I know you'll probably disagree with me. I'm going to walk it through, and then you can tell me where you disagree. There are really two pieces of Section 2.30. Uh, and they are completely different. And when people talk about Section 230, uh, they are often confusing the two because they are really about two very different things. C1 and C2, we can call them like thing one and thing two. Uh, uh, C1 is basically subsidizing by protecting the companies when they include voices that are not theirs. Uh, and that essentially says you're not going to be held liable as a publisher for things that other people say on your platform. So that's a protection uh, for what's included. And there's a separate uh, uh, C2, which says, and we're going to protect you when you decide to suppress certain speech. We're not going to let you be sued for suppressing. And that's another kind of subsidy, although smaller, because there are fewer ways you can be sued for taking people's speech down. But those two things, uh, protection for inclusion and protection for exclusion are both part of Section 230. Uh, and it turns out the people who want to get rid of Section 230 or change it often have very different views about those two things. Uh, so now, Neil, I know you said you you had some quibbles with my suggestion, probably the suggestion that it's a subsidy. So go for it. Oh, I, you know, I, I'll i just put aside that that we can call it, you know, various different things. But um, uh, the, I, I think the, the, the gloss that I would put on it is that courts in many ways have said that C1 and C1 is by far the most used protection uh, under Section 230, um, that C1 uh, covers both what they what's hosted and choices that the platforms make to take content down. So it's not just C2 that covers uh, moderation. C1 also protects that 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 editorial function of- uh, When of they say, I just, I, I so disagree with this that I'm taking it down. Uh, yeah, well, yes, yes. Or, or, you know, yeah. And they're not using the C2 protection, they're using the C1. The one other thing I would add is that I think people really confuse um, uh, whether section two, how section 230 protects companies. Like we talk a lot about that it protects them from liability, but the primary, uh, the primary protection as I, as I see it, and when you look at most of these cases, is that the first amendment protects most of these companies from liability. What section 230 protects these companies from is the litigation, having to litigate all the way through to a, a constitutional case about a specific issue. And so, uh, so in many ways, I think of Section 230 as a tort reform bill that's much more like anti-slap laws that allow frivolous lawsuits to get dismissed very quickly, which is important given the scale of us user-generated content and the number of potential cases uh, that platforms could face if they didn't have this quick method to, to get rid of frivolous uh, lawsuits. All right. Well, there we have Neil Chilson uh, trying to persuade the entire right wing of the country to hate tort reform. Uh, Billy, <laughs> uh, can you can you kind of elaborate on on what the core uh, of C1 and C2 are? Give me a, a good example of something where almost everybody would agree C2 is needed or C, C1 is needed. Uh if I go on Facebook and claim that uh, Hillary Clinton is part of a cult of people who are selling kids online, um, you would su suspect that I should be able to be sued for the defamation of saying something like that and not Facebook. Yeah. Right. I, 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 I think I think people sort of understand that. I, I, I kind of agree with you. I think defamation, which is what really triggered 230 in the first place, uh, is a class classic example of speech that could appear on your platform, you might not know, you certainly don't know whether it's true or not in most cases. I mean, in your case, I think we probably would. Uh, but uh, in many cases, you're not even going to know whether it's defamatory. Uh, it, it could well be that in the particular community that somebody is uh, um, uh, 
spends their life in, uh, it is defamatory to say that uh, uh, they don't believe in a particular religious doctrine, which most of us wouldn't be familiar with, but which would be defamatory to them in their church community. Uh, and so the platform is completely at sea, even when it gets a complaint. It, it, it says, well, I don't know. They say it's true. You say it's false. What am I supposed to do? So in those circumstances, it's a little hard to ask them to take on that responsibility. And that is kind of the classic, to my, example, uh, to my mind, example of a C1 where we need C1, which is why getting rid of 230 is a little hard to take. Uh, how about C2? Uh, what would you say was a classic example of something where uh, most people would agree, of course, you've got to protect their ability to suppress that kind of speech. Neil? Uh, well, let me give a, what might seem like an innocuous example, but I, I think, uh, and, and again, I would say this is probably protected by C1 as well. Um, but for example, if I set up uh, you know, a blog that, um, or a Facebook group that, that um, uh, focuses on knitting, let's just make it a blog, right? Where it's my mm -hmm. personal blog about knitting. Uh, not one of my uh, top 10 hobbies, but let's just assume that. Um, uh, and people come on there and they want to talk about all sorts of other things. Um, uh, you know, I, I think probably people intuitively understand that I should be able to take down that irrelevant mm -hmm. content in order to maintain the, the, the usefulness of my community to the people who want to be there to talk about knitting. And um, and, you know, absent 230, there is some, at least some risk that for, like, if, if people wanted to come and, and sue me over taking down that content, I might get dragged into court and have, it'd be much more expensive, uh, than, than in the section 230 context. Now, that's not what they know. had in mind when they, when they passed it though, they, uh, they, they has a pretty good idea of what they thought was offensive speech that you could take down. Right. So, so, I mean, you're, you're right. So the, probably the more, well, I would say they did have in mind that, that they wanted the internet to have lots of different communities uh, that were able to sort of police themselves, but maybe the more classic use case for 2B uh, and 2A is speech that is protected by the first amendment, but can be, but, but a, a person doesn't want to host on their site. So pornography is a great example, right? Yeah. Um, lots of people, you know, Facebook and, and, and Twitter, uh, you know, they want a place where lots of people feel comfortable to come and engage. And so they take down pornography. Um, that speech is protected under the first amendment um, uh, from government interference. Uh, but platforms, you know, just because of the kind of community that, that they want, they, they want to take it down. And, and Section 2, uh, C2 uh, allows them to do that. And, and C1, I think, as well. Yeah, you, you, you've said that a couple of times. I, 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 can you elaborate on that? C, C1 basically says you're not going to be treated as a publisher uh, just because you let people use your forum. Um, yeah. Why do you think that protects you when you take people down? Uh, well, so I, I mean, the courts have basically looked at looked at this and said that uh, that the editorial discretion uh, that exists by you're not going to be treated as a publisher for the the you know for for liability purposes, um, but you can act in an editorial way on your site, and so I, I think those two things are very intertwined. If you're not going to be treated as the the publisher or speaker of any information provided by somebody else there's an editorial element in there as well. And that's how courts have uh, applied C1. And that's why yeah. I think most cases are, are used under that. I, I'm, I'm skeptical about that. It seems to me that, uh, that C2, which is very clear about what the, uh, uh, about the protection for editorial decision-making is more appropriate. And in a close case, you might say, well, I'm not gonna read C1 as sub silencio uh, overriding the very clear rules in C2. But I, I, I take your point. The, the, courts, the courts have not exactly covered themselves with glory in this area. Uh, they, uh, they've been heavily influenced by some very effective lawyering by um, a combination of business interests and civil society uh, to, to maximize Section 230, don't you think? Uh, I, I mean, 
I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I agree with that characterization exactly. I think, uh, you know, I, I think the courts, what we do know is that the courts have gone through what is in many ways like a common law process, applying the law to many, 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 many different sets of facts, hundreds of cases. Uh, and over time, uh, you know, the, the, the law has uh, evolved in application to where we have it now. And so, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a bit Hayekian in this sense, and uh, I'm a fan of the common law approach. And uh, in many ways, I think that uh, we, we look back at that history of hundreds of cases and say, hey, this is not decided right um, uh, uh, at some peril, right? We should respect some of that gained knowledge over time. Not that, not that the words are sacrosanct, but that's, that's sort of how I think about it. I agree. And I think Section 230 is a maximalist statute. So I kind of think when the courts have, have applied it in the sort of ways that I think Stuart is saying is sort of a maximalist approach, I think it's because the statute is pretty broad in its protections. Well, yeah, although, uh, you know, they, there have been decisions where the courts have said uh, um, a, a competitor complains that their speech about their product is being taken down because it competes with the platform's speech. Uh, and the court said, sorry, Section 230, you don't get to complain about anti-competitive behavior in moderation of speech. Uh, uh, that's, that may be an antitrust violation most places, but thanks to Section 230, it isn't. That strikes me as pushing the protection for editorial decision-making and takedowns way beyond what Congress had in mind. So uh, can, I, can I flip the script a little and ask you, do you think that do you, uh, do you think the First Amendment allows a, a company to take down competitor speech on its own platform? I, 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 it's hard for me to under, I, I don't know that uh, an antitrust action, the, inter the intersection between antitrust and First Amendment is, is not crystal clear, but uh, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that um, the First Amendment would tolerate requiring a company to leave up the speech of a competitor on, on its platform. In a circumstance where there is competition, you might be right, but where they, the competitor controls a platform that is dominant, it seems to me that that's, a, that, that's pretty problematic. Uh, and uh, yeah. just to, to remind you what the C2 protection for taking stuff down is, it is not uh, uh, something that says you, you, you can do anything, you can take anything down. It says that uh, uh, you can take down, now uh, let's see, where's the, where is that language? Um, anything that the provider considers to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. So you have to read that pretty hard to turn otherwise objectionable into, yeah, it, it's, it might cost me sales. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, there's also 2B, which says any action taken to enable or make available to information content providers or others, the technical means to restrict access to the material described in paragraph one, which is another category of yeah, uh, I, I'm going to put that today, aside because yeah, it's yeah. it's it's not that it it's something users can use. So I I'm going to put that aside. But but, but as know, Billy it, said, otherwise objectionable is a pretty broad phrase, and so uh, um, Congress wrote it that way. The courts have interpreted it quite broadly, and I think that's pretty consistent with the First Amendment rights of of, of companies uh, to. Uh, to decide what's hosted on their platform. So let's let's let, let's move into some of the discussions about uh, otherwise objectionable and and some of the ideas about how to discipline, if that's appropriate, uh, uh, the kind of authority that uh, social media exercises when it suppresses speech. Uh, um, the the kinds of things that we've seen for regulating what, what we're calling, I'm calling at least C2 uh, uh, immunity, um, includes a, an effort to say otherwise objectionable needs to be narrowed because um, the platforms are basically using that and they persuaded the courts that uh, otherwise objectionable means if they have an objection to it, they could take it down. Um, and uh, many of the 
proposals have said, why don't we narrow that down to something a little more objective? Uh, uh, and I wondered uh, uh, what you thought of those proposals. Uh, uh, Billy, let me start with you. Um, so if, I, if I'm getting this right, I believe that some of the proposals that I've seen are the Online Freedom and, and Viewpoint Diversity Act from Senator yeah, I, I think we had something like this from uh, the Justice Department. Uh, that, yeah, that was the Trump administration. Yeah, yeah, and, and I believe I believe they were pretty substantially similar. Um, in, in general, uh, it, right. it was clear that they were sort of informed by the same sort of concerns here, right? And what they basically wound up doing is, is two different things. Number one, sort of raising the, as you said before, the current language says, "Hey, if an interactive computer service considers this to be uh, fall into one of these buckets, right?" It raises that to objectively reasonable standard, yeah. right? And it also limits the number of buckets you can sort of play with here, right? In terms of protections uh, to, if I'm recalling this correctly, uh, uh, anything that promotes terrorism or self-harm. Um, and I believe there's one other one, I'm sorry, I can't recall uh, exactly which one it is right now. But the key point is that- uh, it, violent, violent extremism, self-harm, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, and, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, promoting terrorism. Those are the kinds of things that I'm seeing. I think it also says if it's just unlawful. Um, yes. Right. Um, sorry, it took me a little bit there to remember it. Um, and uh, I mean, I think the main problem with this is it's, it, it's sort of non-exhaustive, right? I think one of the things that I actually bring up to this point is, uh, what about spam, right? Or what about election disinformation or medical misinformation? Things that Congress has actually bugged these platforms to actually take down in the last year or so. Um, this doesn't contemplate it um, as well, right? And and I know I'm being long-winded here, so just one more point. I want to return to the spam issue because as James Grumman at, uh, at Cornell Law School, I think, has talked about, spam is one of those situations, right, where it's uh, someone abusing an information technology infrastructure, right? And in ways to right. get people's attention. And Congress is gonna be really bad at finding ways to like define that uh, in, in legal terminology. So I think, it, I think it makes sense to sort of leave a broader sort of viewpoint of, of C2 generally for emerging technologies and new platforms. Uh, and Neil? Oh, oh, you're on mute. Thanks, I probably would have, uh... May have been better than what I was going to say to just <laughs> just watch my mouth flap. Um, uh, you know, I, sorry, I was scanning through some of the the chat, so I may have lost the thread a little bit here. Uh, there's a lot of great questions in here, really hard. Okay, well, we're going to get to them shortly. But, but uh, yes, um, uh, so you know, I the 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 DOJ type proposals. I think um, re remember if you think of this, and and I, I I I agree, not everybody does, but if you think of this law as primarily a sort of tort reform where uh, activities that the, the companies are doing uh, are, uh, are protected by the First Amendment and would get thrown out of court if somebody brought a lawsuit under uh, uh, for those activities, um, then to the extent that the categories of, uh, of speech are narrower than what, um, uh, what the companies would be allowed to sort of exercise their rights under the First Amendment, then I think we uh, we start to remove uh, the incentive for user-generated content. And that's the ultimate uh, outcome. That's the ultimate purpose of Section 230 is to uh, provide uh, the ability for user-generated content platforms to exist. And uh, and if you narrow, if you, if you, narrow the categories um, of moderation such that the companies um, are forced to either take down more content because they're concerned about liability or um, to face uh, a lot of you know, expense in defending their moderation decisions, um, that undermines the, the purpose of Section 230 uh, overall. And so I think a lot of these, I, you know, we can talk about a lot of the immunities, but that's how I think about all of them. Like how much do they undermine the ability to, to quickly dispose of frivolous litigation or abusive litigation? Because that is, so, that is the core problem that Congress was tackling. All right, let me, let me, let me challenge you on that from, from at least the, the right. Uh, um, 
there is no way, there is no world in which Twitter says, oh, maybe we shouldn't have users participating in Twitter. They got nothing but users uh, participating in Twitter. And without that, they've got no business. Uh, So they're never going to do that. And they are spending boatloads of money looking for speech they don't like already. Um, The idea that a few lawsuits would prevent them from making enough money to stay in business is, is implausible, isn't it? I I mean, you're talking about one platform and I would say like Twitter doesn't spend nearly as much money as, uh, you know, Facebook, for example. Uh, Oh, that's true. It's but it certainly spends a ton more money than a platform like Medium does, for example, which I think as far as I know, has like a couple uh, lawyers in 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 house to do this work. And, you know, there's a ton more platforms out there, a ton more platforms out there who are protected by this. And let's not forget, Section 230 also protects users so that when you you know, quote me online, uh, and and uh, you don't you're not responsible for the the thing that I said in my quote. So, so overall, I would say, uh, if we only think about this in the context of the big companies, we're making a, a bit of a a mistake. And I think you're right. Facebook, Google, maybe Twitter, although they don't have this this the the sturdiest business model, um, <laughs> could survive this type of. Impo- like in- increased costs, but there's a whole bunch of people who maybe they run their blog for free and they'd be like, it's not worth it. Like, I'm not going to take the risk to, to, to provide this space. My, my knitting blog, for example, I'm not going to, I'm not going to host it. If like the first lawsuit I get, I'm just going to get rid of the blog. Right. Or I'm going to stop having people uh, participate. So, uh, so I, th- I think we got to think about all of the, all of the potential um, communities online that would be affected by this. Not just, not just the big guys who, probably would be happy if uh, if a law took out a bunch of uh, potential competitors and drove more eyeballs to their to their services. There's a fascinating case, uh, a New Jersey case happening right now with Joanne Reed and whether or not she could be sued for her retweets um, where Section 230 was brought up. I've written a blog about this. And I just bring that up to, to illustrate Neil's point that we keep on talking about Section 230 only defending these big companies, but it also, you know, could defend someone who wants to retweet someone else's content from being sued, so. Okay, I, I, I think all of that is pretty clear. I, I, and let me then turn to C2 reform so we get on the table uh, uh, ideas that are floating around. Uh, there the notion is, uh, the, the most common notion is that, um, uh, sorry, C1. I, I, uh, the, the most common notion is that uh, uh, there are certain kinds of things that you shouldn't be allowed to leave up. Human rights violations, harassment, cyber stalking. Those are things that I think uh, uh, Senator Klobuchar's uh, uh, bill uh, flagged. I, what's wrong with that, at least assuming you buy into the left uh, deviationist view that uh, um, there's already too much bad speech on these platforms. Uh, I think, yeah. go, go ahead, Billy. Yeah, uh, ahead, Billy. yeah I, I'll, um, I'm gonna leave Neil some time here because I think he might push back on me a little bit here. Um, I'm actually, I could see a world where there's a civil rights exception that's written narrowly, very tightly that, mm-hmm. that, that might not eviscerate Section 230. Um, and I'm, uh, it, it seems a little weird uh, seeing, you know, like the roommate's case, uh, the, uh, the Facebook housing ad discrimination uh, regulations that were happening uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I, think, I think the case for, for exempting these, these federal laws specifically is, is fairly strong in my view. I think the problem with the bills like Yvette Clark's or Klobuchar's bill, right, is that they're just too broad. Um, one of the things that I would do if I could sit down with, you know, Representative Clark's staffer or, or Klobuchar's is, what, what is the actual landscape of laws that would be impacted by this? Because their bills say state, federal, and local laws that deal with protected classes, right, or have any sort of impact of civil rights would, would be exempted. Um, does that mean that, like, I believe Washington, D.C. Uh, protects political affiliation as a, politi- as, a, as, as a protected class or a couple other jurisdictions do? Is that really the intent of, of what they want to achieve? It, it might be, uh, and we can quibble about that, but I, I'm very 
skeptical of making a broad exemption when we don't really know the full landscape of what the impact would be on on, on so each your, federal your, level. Your concern is that it 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 encourages more takedowns, uh, and those takedowns will have a uh, a bias based on what's in a local law, and a local law could uh, uh, could include a lot of things. There's plenty of, of bills that say you can't discriminate based on veteran status, and that might lead to people saying, well, maybe there's a problem with highlighting how many people in the January 6th demonstrations were ex-military. Uh, so uh, you can imagine that. Neil, you, uh, uh, if you turn off your, uh, uh, turn on your mic, we'll, we'll be glad to listen to you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I think it's interesting to think about some of these uh, exemptions. As I, as I said, uh, as, as, you know, as, as Billy said, we, Federal criminal law is not exempted at all right now, and it's interesting to think about like how federal, um, you know, civil protections on some of this would would work as well. I, uh, the question is how it's structured, right? So the the way that these these turn is essentially like if you uh, if you don't take down, I'm, I'm making the formula very broadly, but it's it's sort of if you don't take down this type of content, you don't get any Section 230 protection, right? And, and so that is conditioning in, in many ways, that's conditioning a, a, a protection or a sort of uh, uh, a benefit um, on a type of moderation. And that raises some First Amendment concerns. Um, now, maybe those are in certain areas, they can, those are uh, surmountable, um, but, but that's the way I, I, I kind of think about it. I wish there was a more targeted way to say, uh, and, and sorry, I, sh I should say it this way. If you step back and you said, look, you are not allowed to leave up. What if you just wrote a, leave section 230 aside, just say, what if you wrote a law that said you have to take down content that does X, Y, and Z that fits these categories, right? That law would face a lot of uh, First Amendment scrutiny and for good policy reasons. Um, we don't want the government setting rules about like what people can say on, on, on platforms. And I think as uh, as conservatives, I think that's we should be particularly concerned when when the people writing the rules uh, for what should be taken down maybe don't share our ideas of what what good what speech good uh, speech is. And so, um, uh, so then if we're just if we then we bring back Section two hundred and thirty in here, and that's sort of a mechanism to get at that thing we can't do because of the First Amendment. That should raise uh, that should raise flags for people. That's all I'm saying, and I, I'm not saying. In the particular case of, of uh, civil rights, um, maybe there is a way to do that uh, that works. Um, but I I think that it hasn't been carefully uh, talked about to be narrow. Just just to Billy's specific example, um, if if political uh, affiliation was a protected class, it would mean like you you what you have to let um, you have to let Democrats be in your Republican Facebook group and say just take over it if you want. Like I mean. I, I mean, otherwise you're going to lose Section 230 uh, immunity for your for your platform. That seems that seems pretty heavy handed, and it it seems to undermine the uh, one of the main benefits of it, of the internet, a, which is it, it's a clear it's a clear backfire effect, right? Like, there's no way. I, some of the there are tons of civil rights groups that came out in favor of these bills, and I would like to ask every single one of them: Did you really mean? To, to outline the effect that Neil just brought out, which is the ability for people to go uh, to specific groups, uh, Facebook groups and say, you can't you know, uh, take out my speech anymore uh, based on political affiliation, right? Come on, that's, that can't be what these, uh, these organizations or even the representatives and senators actually want to achieve here. So again, I think this, this was not written uh, narrowly enough to be effective, in my opinion. So I, I think there is a difference between saying you can't kick somebody out of your Facebook group because you don't like what they say, and that Facebook can't deplatform them. Uh, uh, and uh, I want to, I, I want to cover two points before we go to questions, and I'll do it quickly. Um, and Neil, you've raised several times the. First Amendment issue, both in terms of protection of um, uh, platforms for what they allow and protection of platforms for what they take down. I want to talk about taking down because that is suppression of speech. There's just no doubt about it. And 
I, you've said, well, there's a First Amendment right to suppress speech that the platform doesn't want to have on its platform. Uh, and there is. Um, but there have been lots of cases, or enough cases at least, where the courts have recognized that uh, letting one big player exercise its First Amendment uh, rights by squashing the views of a large number of other people is not consistent with the First Amendment's values, and that it is appropriate for government to say there are circumstances where a single company with control of a forum has to allow uh, views that it does it disagrees with, notwithstanding the First Amendment. Uh, why isn't that principle appropriate in the context of C2 uh, suppression? Uh well, again, setting aside 230, because I, I think we're not in 230 land anymore when we're talking about whether or not the government can require a, a, a company to allow speech um, that it disagrees with. Uh, you know, you, you, you called it uh, suppression of speech. I would call it freedom of association, which is also protected by the First Amendment, um, where, where a company just doesn't want to be associated with a certain set of views. And so it doesn't let people use its platform. That is uh, that is very, very strongly uh, protected under the First Amendment. And uh, the, the few cases that you're talking about are cases where, for example, you had a company town that held itself out as providing all the functions of government. And therefore, uh, when it suppressed speech in those conditions- uh, Or a it, shopping it, uh, center, a shopping center. Uh, even there, the protection, their, their, their ability to, uh, to moderate the content uh, in that setting was- was not um, that constrained. It was it was pretty open, and so uh, I, and I think those two analogs are not particularly strong for platforms that are intended. Um, they're much more like uh, newspapers in some ways than they are like shopping malls or company towns. And okay, the First Amendment I, protection for them is is pretty strong in that in that condition. All right, last question. I and that is that this is the the set of proposals that I think might have some chance of succeeding because they are content neutral to a degree. And that is to say that in the context of C2, when you're suppressing speech, you have to live up to your own rules. You have to provide some kind of due process. You've got to have provide some transparency about what you're taking down and why. Uh, let me start with Billy, uh, um, plausible? I have no problem with transparency requirements. I really don't think anyone has any issue with. I think the, the bigger issue is, do those actually deal with the main problems that are animating this debate? If we're more transparent and if people are saying that they're following the terms of service, I actually don't think it, I actually don't think it does. Okay, Neil? Yeah, I would say, I, look, it, it is clear. <laughs> it is clear that it is unclear how these decisions get made at companies. Um, and that that's problematic. Uh, not just from a regulatory point of view, but it's really problematic from a trust point of view. P users don't trust these platforms because the platforms don't explain what they're doing and, and they really should. Um, uh, and so is that a government requirement that they explain? Again, like transparency requirements. I, I think if you go and read their terms of service uh, on all of these platforms, including ones that are you know free speech mavens like, like Parler, they gave themselves every right to take you down for any time, at any time, for any reason. Uh, and, and, you know, so I think if you're just being transparent about that level of uh, <laughs> power, a, it's, it's say, not very Yes, helpful, what you right? feared like, was exactly what we're doing. <laughs> right, yes. We can do whatever we want whenever we want. You know, that's that doesn't help much, right? And so uh, I would say there are laws that require companies to be honest about what they're doing. I mean, I, I spent, you know, years at the Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Trade Commission has deceptive and unfair uh, acts and practices uh, authority. Um, but again, most of most of their terms and conditions are pretty clear that they are, their terms and conditions, what they're promising you is not to leave you up on the platform for the most part. Um, and so uh, while I think that transparency is a must and we should push these companies to do it, uh, I think Finding legal tools that um, uh, that don't over that that's that actually solve the problem is actually is is a bit harder. Um, but you know, if Congress wants to pass some rule that says you have to be transparent about how you take people down, and here's some guidelines on it, you know, I don't I don't see that as 
Okay. The so worst thing in the we, world, we, but I don't think we, it has much to do with Section 230, right? They could do that without changing Section 230. Yeah, or they could do it in Section 230, uh, which is where a lot of people have proposed doing it. Certainly the, the Justice Department did. All right, uh, we're okay. going we're to stop here because we've got a lot of great questions. I'm going to ask Nate to give us uh, uh, the first question. Okay, yes, the questions have been piling up, and I'll do my best to to relay them as they came in. One well, of the first questions, I know, I know Stuart's been keeping us away from antitrust discussion, but one of the first questions was, what would be worse in the panelists' minds, breaking up the monopolies that run social media or repealing Section 230 altogether? Okay, uh, Neil, I'll start with you because you actually have a little bit of FTC expertise. Wow, I hate I hate hypotheticals where you can only choose between two bad things. Like that's the worst. Uh, um, you know, both would have uh, pretty bad uh, effects. I mean, I guess in some ways, two thirty is <laughs> applies much more broadly than a breakup of a single company would. Uh, and so, in some ways, uh, the effects of repealing two thirty would be much broader than uh, than breaking up uh, monopoly. Now, the cav the only caveat I put on that is. Uh, if the way you break up a company is by changing antitrust law, which has a very broad application, um, that could also have some really big knock-on effects. Um, uh, but if you can break up the companies under current antitrust law, if you can show that they're violating the antitrust law now, like we should probably be doing that anyways. Like I, I don't. So it, maybe it shouldn't be an either or. Billy, I agree. All right. I, uh, I'm not sure that's completely fair because uh, under current antitrust law, you couldn't break them up. Uh, and so the real question is, uh, are you going to say because of the extraordinary power they a few platforms have over our speech, we are just going to make sure we break them up, even if Congress has to mandate it. Uh, uh, and given a choice between that and Section 230, um, maybe you'd be more um, concerned about the antitrust uh, remedy. But let's go to question two, because we've got a lot. Sure. So uh, the next question I had on my queue was, um, you know, the, the, the questioner indicated that under Section 230, uh, it's fairly clear and easy to follow and adjudicate under. Uh, and I know we've talked about this a little bit, but if you'd like to expand, you know, if you were, if your hand was forced and you had to get rid of 230, how would you write it in a way that was better than what we currently have? Billy, I, Billy's rolling his eyes because he's he's not sure what he's going to say. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how I could come up with another law that aligned the incentives in favor of user-generated content speech to the same degree that the current law does. Right? I, I know I'm dodging the question here, but. I mean, having a liability shield as strong as C1 has been developed in, in both the statute and, and jurisprudence and with the combination of C2, like, no, I, 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 don't, I don't think I could. Maybe someone could, but I don't have the, the brains to do it. <laughs> Suppose, I, I'll ask Neil this. Suppose you just made it a, uh, an affirmative defense that how could I possibly monitor this kind of behavior. Uh, it means you get a lot more lawsuits, but you probably win most of them. Well, I, I actually think the current law is that it is a, an affirmative defense, but a lot of the courts apply it uh, to allow a motion to dismiss. And so, um, so I don't know that that would change anything. I, I know some of the proposals have that language in it. I think the SAFE it Act is. does. It does. Um, but I don't, I, the courts may just, inter it depends on how the courts interpreted that. They, they might interpret it to mean like, no, we really mean it this time. It's an affirmative defense. But, uh, and there is some extra language, I think, in the SAFE Act that says that they have to prove it, um, which always would move you past a motion to dismiss and raises that, because it, it raises a factual issue. And I think that, again, if the test is how do we balance the incentives to allow user-generated content, that tips it more towards taking down more content or in, uh, incurring a lot more litigation costs. So, uh, you know, I, I will flag, I will flag. I did mention earlier that I'm a big fan of the common law and I wrote a whole article for protocol that points out that it's really fair to say that what section 230 did 
was it cut off the development of common law, right? It, it jumped in front of the development of common law and said, we're gonna do, we're gonna do it this way. We're gonna shortcut um, maybe uh, how common law, especially the common law of defamation develops. That has had downsides, right? I mean, we would not be having this fight if more or less the common law had evolved. It would have been pretty costly in many ways. And maybe we wouldn't have got the same sort of user-generated content platforms. But if it evolved essentially to look more or less like 230, um, what we would have now would be, you wouldn't have anybody to point to. You wouldn't have Congress. Yeah, you, you wouldn't, wouldn't have be able to blame pointing them. to a law and say like, hey, change that law because it wouldn't, it would be a common law. It'd be a common law like protection. And so, um, so there are some downsides to that approach, uh, but, but I am, I really am a Hayekian in that sense that I, I love the common law maybe a little too much uh, in some ways. I, I think you do, Neil, I have to say. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to side with Neil on this. I think the problem in 1996 was that AOL uh, and uh, uh, the kind of other nascent uh, providers of third-party content didn't have the budget to defend themselves. Those days are gone. Uh, and uh, um, if Congress had put a 20 year uh, uh, sunset on 230, uh, we could go back to the uh, common law and it probably would end up uh, not so far from where we are now. Okay, okay. Next so question. here would be my proposal. We, 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 you know, if, if I had to scrap 230, then what we would do is we'd create a, a giant funded like litigation defense, uh, you know, firm for all, for any startup that wants to apply for it. There we go. That would be a, that would be a subsidy that I'm sure everybody and on this call would love. Yeah. That, that, that is, that is a fair point uh, that uh, this is, it's only the very biggest guys who, who have the a budget to defend themselves, but they'll be making the law. Nate, next question. Okay. So we are running short on time. And there's one, uh, one of our attendees has posited, I think four or five questions to the chat. I will uh, ask our team to call on him. He's got his hands raised with the condition that he can only ask one of the questions, his best question for the panel. Fair. So please go ahead and unmute. Uh, all right. Uh, well, thank you. Since, uh, since time is short, I will ask the shortest one. Uh, would a, a duty to deal for giant web hosting providers like AWS and, and only the giant ones, of course, uh, would that really run in the First Amendment problems because I know Neil mentioned that, but but what about the counterpoint that it is an economic regulation and it's a, a least restrictive economic regulation because it's a way to increase diversity in social media and it is an alternative to regulatory meddling and content moderation decisions, which, which may be very uh, bad for all sorts of reasons. I think that's a great question and I'm gonna to add to it just to, to, to stick the knife in a little deeper. Uh, if you think that it is a violation, I, uh, please explain why common carrier rules for uh, 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 phone companies uh, are not. Hey, uh, we could do common carrier. Uh, I mean, if you wanna do common carrier for social media platforms, be careful what you ask for is all I'm saying like that. That is a world uh, that looks really different from that's that's a world that has uh, where Facebook is just flooded with pornography, frankly. I mean, but but you, you, you're, you're, you know what he's saying. He's saying I'm allowed to do that in the case of common carriers. Are you telling me that I can't take the piece of common carrier law I like and apply it to people uh, and that that suddenly becomes a violation of law? So, so I, I don't know, uh, I don't know about the First Amendment implications of that. I haven't thought through that actually um, at, at any uh, great length. Um, uh, I, I mean, duties duties to deal uh, exist in commercial transactions now, and I think at, the courts have been sort of exploring those. Uh, sorry, it's not. Uh, they've been exploring them in the in the context of the Amazon marketplace. Um, like what duties. Uh, does a marketplace have when it, it provides a marketplace to a third party who sells something that then injures the customer and the customer can't find? So it's not it's not the same as a duty to deal, but I think some of those issues are already coming up. Um, if you're talking about this sort of AWS versus Parler thing, uh, I, I have to look at the marketplace. I mean, I, I'm not going to make a First Amendment claim here, but I, I'll make a I'll just make a policy claim, which is that. There's plenty of alternatives out there. Uh, AWS is big, and uh, but it's not, you know, it's like 30% of that market. Um, there's plenty of other alternatives. And, uh, you know, 
some of them may, you know, I, I just don't, I, I don't know how, uh, if this is a uh, necessary to solve the problem that, that we think we have, which is parlor had to go to a different service provider. I don't well, know if there's, it, 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 you know, the, the reality is they are still not up. So obviously it was a pretty substantial barrier to uh, uh, a parlor uh, finding an alternative, but I'm well, they had some really leadership issues as well. So as I understand it, so that may be part of why they're not up. I think they're, I think some of their backers are a little concerned too. And are we going to like pass a law that requires backers not to change their minds when a, a no, platform that, goes that, a different fair way? Fair enough. Yeah. But that, the question was, did a, should AWS have a duty to deal in light of the context of uh, what they did to Parler? Uh, Billy, you get the last word on this. I'm not ready to support a duty to deal yet uh, with regards to this yet, but I, I could, I could see a world where, uh, these infrastructure companies like AWS are being pressured so much not to host specific platforms or specific speech where maybe the market changes and where the context for, for evaluating changes. I don't think we're there yet, but I, I understand the concern animating that. So the, the notion is if there's a market, if you can define the market broadly because of the essentially interlocking social ties that lead to people making the same economic decision, you might say, well, in this case, the market for conservative speech uh, is, has been more or less eliminated by everybody agreeing that they're not going to allow it. Yeah. And okay. I would say in a, in a year where FedSoc has had an amazing success on uh, social media, I, I don't think that- Fair point. I don't think we're in a world where uh, <laughs> conservative speech is, is, uh, is, is at a giant risk, so- well, I, you know, I, 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 I'm disappointed that I was not able to, to content moderate e either of you off this platform, uh, uh, but it was, a, it was a great, entertaining and wide ranging discussion of Section 230. And I hope that everybody uh, uh, has gotten uh, at least better informed about what the issues are. So thanks for tuning in. And uh, thanks to Neil and Billy, who did a great job. It was great yeah. fun. Thank you, Stuart. Have a great Friday. On behalf of RTP, we just want to thank all of you uh, for your insights today. A great conversation. We look forward to having you back again soon. To our audience, we welcome feedback by email at rtp at regproject.org. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you.